disease in some in East Africa and many in West Africa, which occur outside protected areas. For example, in Guinea, 90% approximately of chimpanzee population occurs outside protected areas. So this creates a huge challenge for brain conservation, uh, balancing with people livelihoods, and also one thing we should bear in mind is local national development uh, plans. So consequences for people in general, um, we have economic costs, um, there have been a few studies, uh, only a few really, that have evaluated impact on crops uh, as a result of damage uh, from crop rating. Um, I put in here livestock loss. There has been a discussion or anecdotes of chimpanzees uh, depredating goats and chicken, but these are sort of still uh, quite uninformed of it. Um, it wouldn't be surprising if these occur. And property, such as fences or beehives, in cases of chimpanzees who have um, a particular liking for honey. Social costs um, are often related to uh, well, loss of life or injury. This is particularly relevant to chimpanzees, more so than the other uh, bonobos and gorillas. There have been cases in gorillas, um, but cases of aggression on humans. Uh, have particularly been reported in chimpanzees. Social costs are also fear for safety among people. Um, women and uh, children going to fields uh, might have uh, fear uh, for uh, walking along trails where they might encounter great apes. Uh, social costs are also extra labor, for example, for guarding crop fields and energy in terms of maybe putting in place mitigation strategies, possibly such as building fences. And travel restriction is also a social cost. We also should bear in mind cultural costs. Um, there are many areas, and some areas concerning bonobos or chimpanzees, for example, where um, these great apes are uh, culturally, uh, traditionally preserved. <coughs> but with increased conflict, this is compromising uh, this sort of traditional concept of, of, of uh, conservation of the great apes in these areas. So consequences for great apes are important to highlight, um, there is increased risk of being killed intention intentionally in retaliation for conflict. Um, we know of examples in gorillas, um, and unfortunately, sadly enough, this is a very recent example in Guinea of a female chimpanzee who actually got um, clobbered to death by humans uh, in an area um, beside a mining company. I haven't got the full details yet. Uh, so, or to prevent future conflict, we don't really have many reports of that uh, in Great Apes in Africa yet, but I would expect that we might uh, see some in the future. And accidentally, of course, through snaring, this is particularly relevant to gorillas and also chimpanzees, particularly in East Africa. Um, somehow, uh, West Africa communities have learned to uh, dislodge snares um, and, and have circumvented the problem. There is, of course, the risk of being captured. So the more people and humans encounter uh, great apes, uh, maybe there's also an incentive to um, deal with the problem by capturing or killing uh, the animals and uh, therefore fueling the pet trade. And indeed, uh, problem, problems of conflict seem to be one of the main causes now for incoming orphans, uh, um, for example, in West African sanctuaries. So Syria and Guinea, I, I cannot speak for in East Africa, sorry, but I think it's a similar situation. So we are seeing a shift in, in the reasons why uh, orphans are coming into sanctuaries and, and, and the consequences of conflict. Obviously consequences on great apes are stress and disease, closer proximity between humans and great apes, uh, and increased risk of disease transmission, and obviously also the stress in the animals, which might lead to high mortality rates and possibly lower reproductive success. We haven't got you know, strong evidence uh, yet on this, but there are some uh, suggestions. So causes, I, 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 I oops, sorry, I, I sort of listed some causes in not particular order, but I just want to highlight some of the main causes that we observe, at least in Africa. I'll just highlight those individually. One of the main causes are, is land use transformation and habitat loss. So we have evidently in many areas, uh, particularly outside protected areas, uh, where great apes occur, changes linked to development. We have an increased demand for land, for food production, and also larger scale development, uh, which is uh, 
very much compromising the situation and exacerbating conflict is timber, energy, and raw material extraction. And that has a direct impact on livelihoods. So you have large-scale development, but this is having an impact. This is changing the aggregate's habit uh, behavior and uh, therefore uh, increasing conflict in those areas. So this can marginalize, fragment gradient habitat, leading them to rely more on crop grading uh, to survive, because a lot of the natural resources are being dim uh, diminished, and to act more aggressively towards humans. So if they feel provoked and stressed, we see behavioral changes, particularly in chimpanzees, where chimpanzees will react more aggressively. And there are cases in Humai district in Uganda uh, concerning uh, more aggressivity towards humans. So one other uh, point is human population growth or population movement and influx in localities. This often results in increased land cultivation or plantation. You therefore get increased rate of frequency of encounter between humans and great apes. So you have path encounters, surprise encounters, which may result in uh, uh, aggression. Uh, crop rating, obviously, uh, around national parks, you've got gorillas crop rating um, in, uh, outside along the forest edge, uh, but also outside protected areas, you've got intense crop rating in many areas, particularly for chimpanzees. Uh, there's a recent review that um, um, compiled uh, 36 cultivars consumed by chimpanzees across 10 range of countries, including 51 plant parks. So you can see that in, in chimpanzees in particular, it's very widespread. Um, the also, the result of uh, growth, influx, and development in some ways is the uh, transport infrastructure, and road development, and traffic on roads. And this is problematic in sort of these forest agricultural matrix where you have indeed chimps using different areas crossing roads. The road that you see here at the top here uh, with a motorbike in the back is mainly planned to be tarmac. And this is one of the main roads that chimpanzees cross in the Bosu community and even where I work. So this raises uh, big problems and, and might increase conflict issues. So obviously, with uh, increased proximity, more humans, uh, human encounters, you have, as we talked about before, uh, the risk of disease transmission. So I will not uh, dwell on this too much. I will explain, however, this is a female chimpanzee carrying a dead infant. Um, and you can see, I mean, uh, the, the area of it here, you have a young female who lost her first infant through disease, respiratory disease, and she's probably in Pukai next to a village. So, uh, one of the other issues which was referred to yesterday is uh, wildlife habituation to humans uh, through different mechanisms for provisioning, tourism, as we talked about today and yesterday, and research. Obviously, the consequences of these activities is directly that chimpanzees and gorillas become less fearful. So, for example, in Buindi, I mean, apparently gorillas were raiding crops before, but this became more exacerbated as the gorillas were getting habituated. So they become less faithful, fearful, more confident to crop rate. They approach human habitation, restrict more travel on the roads, and even potentially attack humans if provoked. I say if provoked. We compiled a review of chimpanzee attacks in the area uh, where we work, and the consequence of this, and the analysis of this, was there is that there, in all cases, uh, provocation was a result of aggression. So increased competition for wild resources, and this is particularly uh, relevant, for example, where uh, oil palm, feral oil palms being harvested by local humans. I know this is one of the major concerns in northern uh, Sierra Leone, for example, and the chimpanzees are basically feeding on the oil palm fruit that's been harvested by the humans. Uh, but I would like to highlight uh, a study that I've conducted that actually suggests that in spite of the heavy use of the oil palm by lots of chimpanzees, the oil palm trees do not necessarily die as a consequence of the activities. So abundance and distribution of wild foods is affected by the change in habitat. Chimpanzees, great apes, gorillas, bonobos are very smart. They learn new things and they learn, they innovate and they will socially learn from other members of their group. And this is a case where you will have integration of new dietary habits, so new crops being integrated in their regime. Uh, dietary regime, this is an example, Bosu chimpanzees recently starting to feed on rice stands. Uh, in uh, rice paddy fields. So, climatic factors and stochastic events, I've already mentioned it, we don't quite understand what the impacts of climate change and the change in the natural resources and, uh, and fruit, fruiting patterns will have potentially on, on inciting red apes to, to crop rate. 
Um, preventive mitigation strategies, so I'll briefly go over them. Uh, guarding is one of the main um, uh, sort of approaches, a traditional approach. Um, I mean, particularly with children or uh, families guarding the crops. Um, the problem with that is often is energy and time cost. And, and if children are sent in fields to guard crops, they don't go to school. And so that this has a very huge impact on, on, on children. Uh, obviously, guarding can be more uh, uh, infrastructure based and more controlled and managed with guard patrols and intervention teams. And it's a good example of this around Windy uh, and the Yugo project where they have intervention teams whenever gorillas enter uh, crop raiding fields. So the risk of injury is also uh, to bear in mind in these cases. Artificial natural barriers, physical, biological, um, these are labor and time intensive generally and require maintenance. So they're not always necessarily the best strategy, but uh, they can potentially be effective. The problem with this is that there's been a, a very limited testing or results, published results yet on, on these uh, measures. Uh, buffer zones could be set up with inedible crops or non-invasive plants. Um, and there's been some testing out around windy forest <coughs> uh, of, of, of such buffer zones. You could also have direct crop protection with chemicals such as chili, and that's been also tested out. Success, um, I, if someone knows more about this, you can fill it. A visual and acoustic repellents have not been um, really applied to great apes, they've been applied to other um, human primates, but the problem is that great apes are readily habituate, and this is a, a major uh, issue. Land use changes and habitat restoration is something to bear in mind. Um, spatial distribution of crops and buffer zones is very important. Um, where to plant crops, to select which crops are inedible versus edible crops around uh, the areas of high sensitivity around forest edges. We can consider also high and low risk crops. crops. So there are some crops that are more favored than others by great apes. And so this is something to, to analyze. Um, the selective clearing as well. This is quite important where especially a lot of slash and burn is ongoing. Maybe encouraging to preserve some uh, great ape keystone resources as to not minimize too much natural resource availability. Um, there's been some arguments that distance of fields to forest edge can be an effective mitigation strategy. There have been suggestions in Uganda before of a 500 meter <coughs> distance, but I, uh, from experience, at least in West Africa, uh, this might not be effective. Because great apes are very uh, flexible in their travel patterns, and we know that chimpanzees can actually venture out quite far, far in in agricultural forest matrix. But this might be effective maybe for gorillas depending on how they can reach the fields. Um, this is just relevant to chimpanzees, but if it does prove the case that we are getting really depredation on goats and chickens, we might want to think about improving livestock management and keeping of those animals in villages or uh, uh, concerned. One important point is habitat restoration. So if there's sufficient natural foods around for great apes, uh, we're potentially minimizing um, the risk of them going out crop raiding, especially in periods of food scarcity. It, they, it doesn't mean that you're going to stop it, but you might minimize it. And preserving key areas, and these are like river, riverine areas which are generally high in productivity, food productivity, and also important for the preservation of water for villages. So this is something to, to think about. I put this in here, it's not relevant to great apes in Africa. There is no currently program of capture and translocation of problem conflict animals, but I know it's very relevant to Asia, but I quickly wanted to address this. Uh, it basically involves capturing moving animals from problematic zones to a new ideally protected site where conflict is not an issue now and in the future. But this is complicated logistically, it's risky, and it's financially demanding, and it, there are huge ethical concerns behind us, and requires a lot of expertise. And not only ethical, but cultural implications. Imagine, for example, around Bosu, we started discussing translocation of chimpanzees because it was crop raiding. This would have a huge effect on the cultural life, social life of people who hold chimpanzees as a totem. So these are the things that need to be considered, and I think it's definitely not, not an option. It's not a solution to the problem. And even I would say it's not even last resort, but, but I need to say. Direct compensation schemes, and there have been reviews on this, and there's a current review on, ongoing. Uh, Evan uh, Bowen Jones is compiling information on compensation schemes. And um, there are huge problems with evaluating uh, the extent of damage and 
administration levels. Uh, the financial compensation schemes are not always uh, usually uh, effective. And in essence, you have to remember this is not the solution to the problem. We need to actually deal with the baseline problem, not actually just act on compensating. So if compensation is considered, we also need to tackle the problems. So one thing uh, that often does arise is creating value uh, for great apes. Uh, in order to uh, increase tolerance towards conflict, and also, uh, so one, one approach is uh, schemes benefiting local people. This could be direct benefit <laughs> through um, local people, um, maybe gain through a primer. I mean, it could also be um, tourism and research uh, development. Indirect benefit schemes are very important, I think, and are probably one of the, one of the best ways forward with the development of sustainable local development projects. In uh, improving, as we heard before, human health, sanitation, and hygiene is a very nice example of a project in Uganda, Conservation for Public Health, which has been very successful. And this benefits local people as well as great apes because they're susceptible to disease transmission. Access to water, protein alternatives, uh, agricultural yields, um, schools, hospitals, we can think of many different um, uh, options. But I think also um, one important approach from the local empowerment schemes, which are relevant to tourism development as well, but uh, where local people are given more responsibility for managing habitat and resource use and managing conflict. Uh, for example, for encounter rate problems, uh, we explained that a lot of the, the encounters were surprise attacks. And uh, the, the villagers themselves took the initiative to maintain trails and paths that lead to fields so that they would minimize the risk of surprise encounters. This is a small initiative that the village took on their own. We actually explained the problem and we, we analyzed it with the village and they themselves took this initiative. So um, this is where understanding of the problem comes in and education and training is very key. Um, we, it's essential to help develop skills in, in dealing with gradient conflict in target areas. Expertise is very essential in that domain. But it's also very key to promote public understanding of the roots of the problems of the conflict. Uh, and also to help people understand why the great apes are behaving the way they do. They need to gain a bit of understanding of great ape behavior and ecology. Um, you know, why are they maybe extensively cooperating in this particular area, or suddenly this one year they're cooperating more, uh, etc. And one very important thing, which is particularly relevant to chimpanzees, but brothers as well, and probably bonobos in the future, and for now there are not many instances with bonobos, is how to behave when encountering chimpanzees. These aggressions often are the result of mistakes and errors in behavior by humans, and uh, we can circumvent that if we put a lot of effort in education. And hopefully, uh, with in parallel different schemes working together, we can increase human tolerance towards great apes in some areas at least. So, and help and engage with the communities to find concerted solutions to the problems through informal uh, discussions. This is another uh, strategy I put in here, but um, it can go in, in parallel of obviously improved policy and regulation and management of land use and resource exploitation. I just mentioned this situation with the chimpanzees being, uh, you know, literally covered in the village beside a mining company. I mean, obviously, these mining activities are large, expansive land loss. Uh, actually exacerbates conflict and we need therefore more uh, uh, policy and regulation on that to minimize conflict uh, issues. The role of research and understanding the problem is very important. It's probably one of the baselines initially, um, but this is just a, a suggestion that different approaches in research, social economic studies, evaluating social impact, the opportunity costs, quantifying the economic impact. There have been very few studies in fact doing this, particularly for great apes. Uh, also analyzing human influx and demographic trends and trends as well as development patterns and modeling that in the future as well, that can also be beneficial. Um, understanding people's perceptions and attitudes and you have to bear in mind these change, so these have to be repeated studies. Across generations we've seen generation gaps in tolerance as well um, and movement of people over time. Ecological and behavioral studies where possible uh, obviously uh, can be quite helpful in understanding the roots of the problems, the sites where the conflicts do arise, if it's several individuals or more than one individual, um, trying to better understand the problem in order to try and resolve it. And lastly, but most importantly, and this is where there still remains a huge gap, is really starting to put in place, in concert with uh, all stakeholders, and particularly with the communities, 
um, develop schemes and test them and evaluate the effectiveness. Of course, one scheme may not work in one place and may work in another, uh, but we need more information on this and develop novel strategies as well. So, all in all, resolving, um, well, graded conflict is, is really a challenging affair, but we, it's, it's a very serious concern. I think this is going to be one of the major problems uh, affecting uh, uh, great apes um, more and more, and, and we're seeing this already in West Africa. But we have to bear in mind the different ecological, social, and cultural, and economic realities, so different solutions might not work in one place, and, and in some areas it might be completely ineffective as well. We just never know. Uh, but there are also different responses by different great ape species, so we have to bear in mind different behaviors and different responses. But one thing I do want to highlight with these issues is that we should be very careful when approaching conflict. We do not want to create conflict where there is none. They might be cooperating in one area, but people don't perceive it as conflict. So we don't want to create uh, a situation where people become sort of you know, looking for some kind of compensation because they hear that in another area they are being compensated or whatever. So we need to be very sensitive to that. Um, and, you know, most importantly, it is essential to engage concerned communities, affected people, identify those affected people, and develop together short and long-term strategies in concert, and also revise the approach. Maybe you start up with one particular approach first, but it does not work. Uh, but then you have to reassess and reanalyze. And partnerships between, you know, uh, local people, conservation development NGOs can, you know, uh, effectively work together in, in solving conflict issues. And might be a, a very uh, uh, sort of future avenue for this. So creating incentive and value to preserve our